This video um, is for the functions and statistics portion of the two 2016 objectives of the Algebra 1 SOL. Um, it goes over uh, the objectives that fall into the functions and statistics section. All right, the first part we're going to talk about is domain and range. Okay, so let's review what domain and range is. Domain is your set of x's. And range is your set of y's. All right, sometimes uh, we call the x's the input and the range the output. Using the ordered pair shown, create a relation containing three ordered pairs with a domain of negative one, two, and four. So we got to make sure that these, because it's domain, we want our x coordinates to be negative one, two, and four. So first I'm going to pick the order pair that has a negative one as its x coordinate. That's this pair right here. So negative one, zero. Then I'm going to pick a pair that has two as my x coordinate. This one right here. So two, three. And then I'm going to pick the one that has four as my x coordinate, this pair right here, four, negative two. So again, um, if we're creating a relation that has a domain of negative one, two, and four, we gotta make sure those three are represented in our ordered pairs. This question says, what is the range of this relation? Remember, range is my y's, so I'm going to look at my y coordinates that I use. Um, right away, I can tell that a is not our answer because it says x, such that x is in between those numbers, but range is asking for y's. So, this is a discontinuous graph. Uh, graph. So, all I have to do is list out the y coordinates that I use. So, negative 4, I use 0. I use the y coordinate of 2 and the y coordinate of 4. So the answer is D. Negative 4, 0, 2, and 4, because those are the y coordinates of these points. So this is the point 0, negative 4. This is the point 3, 2. This is the point negative 3, 0. And this is the point negative 2, 4. And so again, um, the y coordinates I use are 4, 0, 2, negative 4. The, the following graph shows a relation. Which of the following best describes the range? So we're looking at the graph. This is more continuous. Remember, range is up and down. It's my y. So it's how far I go from here to here. And my domain is how far I go from here to here. And remember, if I touch arrows, that means it's going on forever in a certain direction or even both directions. So here's my lowest y coordinate. And then it's everything above that. So it's all real numbers greater than, because it's above, negative 4. Just so you know, if they're asking for a domain, the domain will go from here to here. Um, so the domain would be all real numbers because I go from arrow to arrow. But again, they're not asking for that. They're asking for the range. Which of the following graphs appears to be a function? So when it's a graph, it needs to pass the vertical line test. Okay, so that's where I look for. If it touches the graph, more, a vertical line touches the graph more than once, it's not a function. So for instance, on A, touches the graph twice, right? A vertical line touches the graph twice, this is a no. Here, I could draw a vertical line that touches it. Oh my goodness, one, two, three, four, five, six. How did I get six? It's five, one, two, three, four, five, good Lord, okay. That's also not a function. D is also not a function. So let's hope B 
be is which it is because every time I draw a vertical line it's only touching this graph once so b is a function okay again it has to pass the vertical line test which appears which graph appears to show relations that's not a function now they don't always have the not um, highlighted so be careful make sure you read the question so look at a a is a vertical line and that will definitely not pass the vertical line test because one vertical line touches every point of that graph okay, and this one passes the vertical line test this passes this horizontal line passes but a is a vertical line so that one is not a function is this the same question <laughs> i think it is all right well it still doesn't pass the vertical line test i wonder if i left a question out then this one says identify each of the x and y intercepts of the relation shown remember intercepts are where you cross the x axis and where you cross the y axis so here are my x intercepts all right so i click there and there they're asking for the roots the solutions the zeros i would just click those two but they're specifically asking for us to click the x intercepts and the y oops i missed the y intercept all right so those are my intercepts again intercepts are where do i cross that axis so in this case i have two x intercepts and one y <clears throat> for this problem we're also going to find the x and y intercept but this is going to give us an equation so a representation of a function is shown f of x equals negative 4x plus 2 what are the x and y intercepts of this function so to find the x and y intercepts of this function we're going to graph so we go to decimals you type in negative 4x plus 2 and then i look at the x and y intercepts i notice the y intercept is 0 2 and the x-intercept is 0 0.50, which is the same as 1 half 0. So my answer for this one is going to be D, because those are my x and y intercepts. I did not mean to use a highlighter there, but that's okay. <laughs> um, also notice the y-intercept is 2, because the number without, um, or the term without um, the x is also, or we call the constant, is your y-intercept as well. Um, so that's another way where you can double check your work there. All right, but again, the best way to do it is just to graph it and then to look at your X and Y intercepts. This is another um, problem. We're going to graph the equation um, to interpret the graph um, and get information from it. Again, whenever you see a quadratic, that X squared, most of the time, if not all the time on this, we're just going to graph it and look at it for information. So look at function g. g of x equals 9 squared, 9x squared minus 16, which contains the only zeros of function g. So remember your zeros are the same as your roots, your solutions, they're your x-intercepts. So I graphed it. In decimals and as it crosses at negative 1.33 repeating and 1.33 repeating and when I looked at a I typed in I said okay well it can be it could be negative four-thirds and four-thirds so I typed those in the decimal and those decimos and those are the decimals that match my two x intercepts there um, <clears throat> but um, also notice like B has three X intercepts, but our graph only has two. This graph definitely doesn't cross at 16 and nine. And it, uh, again, it can't be D because there's three intercepts there. So my solution is A. The zeros of the function are negative four thirds and four thirds. Remember your zero is the same as your roots, your solutions, your X intercepts when it comes to quadratics. All right. Remember, if they ask for the factors, the factors have opposite signs. Don't forget that. What is f of negative 8 for the function f? f of x equals 11 um, 
times x minus 24 all over 2. And if I look, um, again, I can put this into decimus again, type in my function just as I see it, and then I'm going to type in f negative 8, and then it tells me that that is negative 176. Again, they're just substituting negative 8 into the function, substituting x um, and evaluating. But let decimus do that for you too. Um, f of x equals 11 um, times x minus 24, the quantity x minus 24 all over 2. Type in f of negative 8, and it tells me that it's negative 176. Here's another question just like that. This time we're finding f of 6. If f of x equals x minus 3 squared, so um, the difference of x minus 3 squared, the difference of x minus 3 squared, the difference of x and 3 squared plus 1, what is f of 6? Type the function into decimals, type in f of 6 right after that, and I get that that would be 10. Which number is the zero of the function h? Did I cover up the function with this picture? I sure did. <laughs> oh, but the function's there. Um, so that is the function. I definitely covered up uh, the function there for you. Sorry. Um, I wonder if I can move it over. Let's see. If it lets me. It probably, no, it's not going to let me move it over. Um, <clears throat> So what's the zero of the function? Remember, zeros are your x-intercepts, your solutions, your roots, whenever it comes to quadratics. Whenever, um, whenever you see a quadratic, you're going to graph it. Um, and this one crosses at negative 6, and it crosses the x-intercept at 3. So it says, which number is a zero of the function? Um, let's see. A, negative 6. Okay, it doesn't go through at negative 3, it doesn't go through at 0, it doesn't go through at 6. So, um, again, <clears throat> I'm just looking for the x-intercepts there. Which of these functions has two zeros? So, again, which of these are exactly two and zeros? So, what they're saying is which function... has two x-intercepts. All right, so I graphed the first function. That's red, and if you look at my red function here, it only goes, it, in fact, it doesn't have an x-intercept at all in my picture, but eventually it does cross down in this region, so that will have just one x-intercept. Um, g of x, again, is this blue line. Um, it only has one x-intercept. It has a y and an x, but only one x. The green function is quadratic, but it only intercepts at this one point. So that is not the function with two x-intercepts. The only one that has two x-intercepts is the purple function here. It has an x-intercept um, in two places there. Um, so it's the only one with two different zeros. So that would be d k of x equals x squared plus 11x plus 24. All right, the next section talks about direct inverse variations. The first question talks about inverse variation, but I want to go ahead and take some time to talk about direct and inverse variation. All right. So direct and inverse variation. All right, so um, direct variations, if you remember, um, x increases as y increases, or they decrease together. Oops, that is not decreasing. <laughs> Inverse, x is going to go up um, when y goes down and vice versa. 
are as x goes down, y goes up. All right? The equation for direct variation is y equals some number x. We call that number the constant of variation. For inverse, we're either going to do xy equals k or y equals that number divided by, I don't know why I put 8 there. Oh, because the problem. <laughs> divided by x. <clears throat> For direct variations, y divided by x is going to be the same number, or a constant of variation, so same number every time. And for inverse variations, when we multiply they're going to be the constant of variation or the same number. We don't need to know what the graph of a direct inverse variation looks like, but for direct, it's always a line through the origin. It can have positive or negative slope, but it always goes through the origin. And we'll talk about that more in another problem. So this relation is an inverse variation. Um, notice as my x's um, increase, so if I go from negative 1 to, ne oh sorry, negative 2 to negative 1 to 4, my y's actually go down. They actually get smaller, so 4 to 8 to negative 2, okay? Which equation represents this relation? So if I look, the only one of these that has, that's in the right form of a direct, inverse variation is this one right here okay so again it's the only one that's in the right form we have the constant variation on top variable um, the x on the bottom so it's in the right form it looks like this guy right here the other way I can do this problem whenever they want you to match ordered pairs to equations I like to type in each equation and graph it above those ordered pairs. So I graph negative 1, 8, I graph 4, negative 2, I graph negative 2, 4, and those are the three points you see here. And the only graph that went through all three of those points was D. So that's another way you can do the problem. So first of all, it's the right choice because it's the only one that is written as an inverse variation. And then two, whenever you want to match equations to ordered pairs, type in the equation, type in the ordered pairs, and make sure that the graph goes through those ordered pairs. The other graphs are not. There were lines that didn't go through those ordered pairs, all three of them. So when I graph those, they did not match. The graph of an equation representing a direct variation passes through point A. Locate one additional point. All direct variations go through the origin. All direct variations go through the origin. So if they want just one more point, put that point right in the origin. Because direct variations, they look like that, where they're going through maybe just the one quadrant. They can go like this, or they can come down like that. So direct variations are lines that go through the origin. Okay, so there's your one point. All right, so two relationships are described. Relationship S, Karen drove 160 miles in four hours. Then she drove 80 miles in two hours. Relationship T, Vernon cooked six hamburgers in 10 minutes. Then he cooked nine hamburgers in 15. Which statement is true? Neither is direct. Both are direct or only one of them are direct. So we're going to, um, first of all, the big check, I check right away, make sure either they're both increase and both decreasing. So if I look at relationship S, I have 160 and 4. And then notice both the miles went down and the hours went down. So those both are decreasing. For relationship T, 6 and 10 both increase to 9 and 15. So now the hamburgers increase and the minutes increase. But if you remember for a direct variation,
Um, one of the things you remember is y divided by x needs to be equal the same number. It needs to equal k, or the same number every time, or a constant of variation. For an inverse, it would be y times x would equal the same number. Yeah, so again, inverse variation. Yeah, let's write that down. We'll write it down. Inverse variation. When you multiply, you get the same number every time. Direct divide. Inverse multiply. Why am I putting the word direct? Okay, same number. <clears throat> All right, so let's check relationship S first. So relationship S, I have 160 divided by 4, which would be 40. And then 80 divided by 2, which is also 40. So our constant of variation for that, in, um, for that direct variation would be 40. So that's good. Let's try T. We're going to do 10 divided by, or 6 divided by 10, 10 divided by 6. We'll put them in the same order. So let's do 6 divided by 10. All right. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I'm going to have to put that in the calculator. So 6 divided by 10. I'm going to put that in the decimals. Um, oh, it's 6 tenths. <laughs> and then... 9 divided by 15, when I type that in, it's also 6 tenths. So it has a constant of variation of 6 tenths. So it is also direct. So both relationships are direct variations. <clears throat> point A is an element of a direct variation plus two points other than a that are elements of this direct variation. So for this one, they want us to plot two. So we know it goes through the origin. We also not know it's a line, so it's gonna have a constant slope. So from a to point a to zero, zero, I went up one over four. So by the way, that's a constant of variation, which is four over one, um, so four. And then I can go up four over one, and then there's a second point. The SOL would take any of the points that would fall into that, okay? But you would only need to plot two, okay? So I plotted zero, zero, must go through the origin. And then I knew it had a constant slope. So when I um, drew the slope, which is up four over one. And then if I keep going up four over one, I can get additional points, I only need two. And then I also could work backwards to get another point there. Miss Scott will pay $2,000 to have her house painted. The amount each painter earns, A, varies inversely for the number of painters in that will paint the house. Which equation best represents this situation? So remember, direct and inverse variations, there's no addition or subtraction in them. Boom, those don't work. Choice C is a equals 2,000 times n. That is in direct um, variation equation, but they say that this is inverse. All right, variation. Why am I forgetting how to spell variation? That does not look right. <laughs> there we go. Okay, because remember it's always y equals some constant variation, some constant of variation times x. Um, they use different variables there, but that's where the number is. Our answer is choice D, because remember, an inverse variation is going to be x, y times x equals k, or x, y equals k. I think that's what we normally wrote it or y equals that number divided by x, and this is in the right form, a times n, or um, so those would be our two variables. Okay, so the answer to this one is d, 
because it's an inverse variation and it's the only equation in the correct form. In which table does y vary directly with x? So remember, we're going to do y divided by x, and we're going to try to get the same number every time. Right, direct, uh, you divide. Okay, again, if they were doing inverse, we would multiply to see if we got the same number every time. So let's see. Remember, and it's, um, this one's 3 divided by 1, so y divided by x is 3. 3 divided by 2 is 1.5. So that's a no-go. Choice C, 5 divided by 1 is 5. 7 divided by 2 is 3.5. That is not a direct variation. Choice B, 4 divided by 1 is 4. 8 divided by 2 is 4. 12 divided by 3 is 4. So the answer to this one would be B. Double check. Um, 9 divided by 1 is 9. 7 divided by 2 is 3.5. So choice D definitely does not work. Choice B is the only one when I divide Y by X, I get the same number every time. Remember, that's our constant of variation. So the next section of this, we're going to be comparing tables to equations. Okay, tables to equations. So this is which equation represents the pattern shown in the table. <clears throat> so there's um, a couple of ways we could do this. Um, I, the best way um, is we're going to hit this plus button here. We're going to select the table icon. We're going to fill in the table so it matches the table um, on the SOL. Then we're going to grab each line and see which one goes through those three points. So if we look at the black line is the first choice. Notice it does not it go through the all three points. The purple line also does not go through all three points. The black line does not go through all the points. Oh, they gave us two black lines. So, you know, that's something we got to be careful of. Um, so, make sure when you do that, you can change the colors. You can just click on this and you can change the colors. And then red um, goes through all the points, all four points. One, two, three, four. Okay. All right. So, the red line is 3x minus 1. So, that's choice D. So, Click the plus point, fill in your table. I like to always delete everything when I make a new table, by the way, to make sure it says X1 and Y1, which becomes more important with some other problems. Type in each equation, see which one goes through all of those points. Look at the data in this table. Which equation most closely represents the line a best fit? for this data. So since it's best fit, it's not going to go through all the points, but it'll be the line that's closest to going through all the points. Okay, so again, I'm going to hit the plus button. I'm going to fill in my table, making sure it says X1 and Y1. Um, if I want to find the line of best fit, I type in this Y1 tilde mx1 plus b. It then gives me m, which is my slope, and b, which is my y-intercept. Um, to be honest, it really doesn't matter what letters you put for m and b there, as long as you have the y1 and the x1 here. Um, but we always talked about y equals and x equals z, so I think that's the best way to remember. So they say my slope is 1.77143, which is close to 1.77x. And then my y-intercept is 0 0.13333, which is closest to here. Again, if I cannot remember this tilde, I was like, oh, what do I put in there? Graph your table, graph each equation, and find the line that best goes through the data.
It most closely goes through all your points. But if you want the exact one, type in y1 tilde mx1 plus b under your table, making sure these say x1 and y1. Whenever you put in a table, delete every table or anything else that's in Desmos. It gives you the slope and the y-intercept that best fit, and then you select that one. The number of complaints a company received at the end of each of six weeks is shown in the table. Based on the line of best fit, how many complaints would the company expect at the end of eight? Again, line of best fit, when we see that, we're going to think this guy. Okay, that's the line of best fit that we're going to type in to um, Desmos. Making sure it says X1 and Y1 on the table, I fill it in. Again, you hit the plus button, select table, and fill it in. Type in the Y1 tilde MX1 plus B, and it'll give me what my Y, um, or what my Y equals MX plus B equation would be. So in this case, the slope is about negative 19. Um, my winner, y intercept is 243. Then they see what would they expect at the end of week 8. Put an 8 in for x. And I did that over here in Desmos, and I got 91. Okay, so substitute that um, 8 in for x, and I get 91. One um, tip, if you cannot remember, it's like, oh my gosh, I can't remember this, all those steps. You can kind of follow the pattern. Okay, see what kind of pattern it's making. If I notice these are going up, my weeks are going up by one. My complaints look like they're going down about 20 every time, um, every week. Week eight, so I would have seven and eight. So um, it would not go by number 20, but go down by about 40. And 130 minus 40 is 90. And this is the closest one that goes to that. So if you can't remember the steps, kind of see what if you can figure out what the pattern's happening and then make a best guess based on that. But if you want the exact answer, the exact one they're looking for, put it in the table, get an equation, and substitute your number in for that equation. The table shows a relationship corresponding values of X and Y. Sorry, let me read that again. The table shows the relationship between corresponding values of X and Y. To determine the Y value, and then they give us some choices of um, what we're doing to X every time. So what I did is, again, I filled in the table here. I put my plus, clicked my plus button select the table, fill it in, and then I got different equations for x. So first it says add 3 to the x value, and I typed that in, and it didn't go through the points. Notice um, neither purple one does, but the x plus 3 one, which is this one right here, because I know it's y-intercept is 3, um, doesn't go through that. It says subtract x from that, or oh, subtract 3 from the x value. That didn't go through all those points. Divide x by 3 and then add 1. That is the other purple line um, with the, um, the, that had the y-intercept 1. It, too, did not get through all the points. And then it says to divide the x value by 3 and subtract one, which is my black line here. If you notice, it goes through all of the points, all right? So my choice here is going to be D. So if they want you to match um, a table to things, we're gonna type the table in. And if they give us equations, we're gonna type the equations in. And if they give us statements, we're gonna write equations for the statements and then see which ones go through the points. Or if it says best fit, you can figure out which one most closely goes through all the points.
Using the equation of the line of best fit, again, that's your y1 tilde mx1 plus b. Again, to get those subscripts, all you have to do is type those numbers afterwards, by the way. So if I go to decimals and type y1, it'll automatically make it below. If I type in x1, it'll automatically put it below. Using the equation of the line of best fit, which number is the best prediction of the output when the input is 13? So again, put all my tables, put my table in there. I wrote my order pairs as a table. I typed in y1 till the mx1 plus b. I got an equation of uh, about 9.8 for the slope, so 9.8x. And then 40, I rounded 42.9544 to 43. And then they said for an input of 13. Input is always x. So I put in 13 for x. And when I put that into the calculator, I got 170.4, which is the closest to 170. Again, I could always look for a pattern. I have to put my X's in order for that one and try to make a best guess. But um, the easiest way is to type in the equation, Y1 tilde MX1 plus B, get an equation and substitute in for X. Which equation best represents this data set? All right, so I put in the table. All right, I fill my table in, plus button fill in my table. I can type in each equation, see which one most closely represents all those points. All right, I could type them all in and see which one most closely represents the points. Um, this time, if you notice, some of my equations have, are quadratic. They have the square in them. If you want to find the curve of best fit that goes with a curve, it's y tilde ax1 squared plus bx1 plus c. When I type that in, it gave me a, b, and c. Um, and if you notice, uh, I got... Um, <clears throat> about 1.1 for the um, the uh, x squared term, about 4.2 for the x term, and then minus 4.88 for the other term, the constant term. Um, again, let's say I can't remember that equation. I can type these into a table, type all those um, into a table, and then graph each equation and see which one most closely matches. Um, the When I typed in A, it was way above the points. It was above all those points. The lines, C and D were lines that um, were like, they kind of went like that and didn't really fit the points. But B, when you graph it, really, really goes through those points well. Okay, so it's the, most one, the one that most closely matches. So if you want an equation that fits data, you can always just graph each equation and see which one most closely represents those points. If you want the um, numbers that they're really looking for, you can type in your uh, quadratic curve of best fit and see which one matches the most. Sorry, and get those uh, coefficients. A scientist dropped an object from a height of 200 feet. She recorded the height of the object in 5 tenth second intervals. Her data is shown. Based on a quadratic model, which best approximate the height at 3 seconds? So I hit the plus button and I fill in my table. Since it says a quadratic model, I use this equation, all right? 
it gives me then what A, B, and C would be. So negative, about negative 6.4, about 1.1 for B, and then 200 for C. And then I substituted 3 in. For both x's. Alright, so it's 2, 3, and for both x's, and it gave me 55.7, which is about 55 feet. Again, if you need to make a best guess, we'll say you can't remember the equation that goes through, look for a pattern. I notice these are going up by 0.5 every time, and they're looking for 3. So then I see, is there a pattern that goes here? So this goes up by 5, then it goes up by 10, and then it goes by 20, then we're at 30, then 35. Um, so it tends to be going, um, go, oh, it's going down by 5, down by 10, down by 20, down by 30, by, by 35. Um, Another good reason 55 would work is because the neck that would mean the next bit is going down by 45. So it's kind of on the pattern of increasing um, and then going like by five. So like five and then 10 and then 20 and then increasing that way. So that's another way that you can check your work as well to make sure it fits that pattern. Um, but again, the best way to do it, type in your table, put in the quadratic model, and then fill in for X.